Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's live stream about the North Atlantic right whales, brought to you by the Ocean Tracking Network and the Canadian Wildlife Federation. As part of Oceans Week Halifax, a 10-day virtual celebration of our oceans, taking place from June 5th to the 14th. If you'd like to learn more or register for other events, please check out the link in our event description on Facebook. My name is Brendel Townsend. I'm the Senior Operations Manager and a Blue Shark Researcher at the Ocean Tracking Network, based at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. I know we have people from across the country that have tuned in, but I'd like to begin this webinar by acknowledging that we are hosting this live stream from Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. We are all treaty people. So we're here today to talk about the iconic and critically endangered North Atlantic right whale. Since 2017, OTN has been partnering with Big Spruce Brewing in Cape Breton to produce a delicious IPA by the name of Tag Uret, dubbed conservation in a can that allocates 50 cents from each beer sold to the Canadian Marine Conservation Initiatives. So this year's edition is helping organizations that are working to conserve the critically endangered North Atlantic right whale. Today, we'll be talking to Sean Brillant, the Senior Conservation Biologist for Marine Programs with the Canadian Wildlife Federation. Sean will tell us about right whales, the dire threats that they're facing, and how organizations and individuals can work together to ensure a future for these beautiful animals. So Sean will save time for questions at the end of today's presentation. And if you're watching us on Zoom, you can submit your questions in the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. If you're watching today on Facebook Live, you can leave your questions in the comment section below the video. So hi, Sean, thank you for being here today <laughs> and presenting right whales on, um, on Ocean's Day. And I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Brendel. And welcome everyone. Welcome to Ocean's Day 2020. Uh, my name's Sean Brilliant. Uh, I work with the Canadian Wildlife Federation. I'm based in Halifax, Nova Scotia on the east coast of Canada. Um, lots of wildlife worth talking about on Ocean's Day in the ocean. Uh, lots of very amazing things we could talk about, but probably what you've heard a lot about lately are North Atlantic right whales. And that's what we're going to talk a bit about today. I want to give you a very, I want to talk about a lot of stuff, a, a little bit about a whole bunch of stuff and try and explain why this situation is so important to answer your questions and um, to make sure as you may hear more stories about North Atlantic right whales or the situation, I wanna give it, you a chance to, to explain what the situation is about, why it's important and have you a bit better trained so that you can understand what the situation is and maybe even participate in what, what we're trying to do in, in terms of correcting this situation. So, so um, let me share a screen with you. I am, uh, I'll just go through a, a slideshow here so you have some nice pictures to look at rather than just me. And um, so this is what I wanna to talk to you about. We're gonna talk about saving North Atlantic right whales, but more importantly, I wanna talk about what you need to know about this situation and about these whales. Okay, okay, that's not working. There we go. This is a North Atlantic right whale. This is a large whale that lives off Canada's east coast. Uh, it is a very powerful animal. It has like an upside down kind of smile because of a large curved jaw. It's a, a, a beautifully ugly creature in many ways. Um, it's a filter feeding animal has these large brushes in its mouth and it swims through the ocean eating zooplankton. These are essentially uh, bugs in the ocean about the size of a grain of rice and they swim through the ocean, take mouthfuls of water and, and filter this food out and this is what they live on. On their face, in addition to their curved jaw, which you're sort of seeing poking out of the water here, they have these white spots all over their face. These are called callosities. These are just growths, hardened areas on their, on their body. These are unique for every single right whale. And they're actually very useful for scientists for being able to identify which animal is which. And uh, they're a bit of a fingerprint for us to know um, when we come across an animal, which one we're looking at. One of the distinguishing features of these animals, there are several, but one of the distinguishing features of these animals, if you ever happen to be on the water and see a whale spout, 
if you see this V-shaped blow, chances are in Atlanta, Canada, that you're seeing a right whale. There aren't very many of these whales that will blow this way, and certainly very few here in Atlanta, Canada, in addition to these white spots all over its, uh, all over its head. Um, the other thing that's notable about it is that it has no fin on its back. It has a very smooth back. And, uh, and these are very large, very round and very fat animals. The right whale was, was the first whale I'd ever seen growing up in the Bay of Fundy. And it scared the wits out of me when I was a kid and I first saw one. It was bigger than the fishing boat I was on and just terrified me because it was so huge. These animals are incredibly fat. They are uh, about 13, they can get up to about 13 meters long, about 50 feet. They're uh, a about the same size as a humpback, for example, but they weigh much, much more. They're very round and rotund. They have very thick layer of blubber all around their body. It takes, right whales, as far as we know, seem to live about 60 to 80 years. They're related to bowhead whales in the north, and there's some evidence that bowhead whales may live up to 100 or 150 years of age. So right whales, we suspect, might be able to get that old. The sad thing is none of them seem to reach old age. They seem to be killed before they reach that stage. It also takes about nine or 10 years before a right whale can start breeding, before they can become parents. And so uh, uh, it takes a long time to develop, like many mammals as well, and to develop the reserves necessary and, and to become mature to be able to do that. Now, unfortunately, the reason they're called right whales is because of this blubber layer in some ways. Centuries ago, as we started hunting these whales, and even before commercial whaling started, if you were looking for a whale because you wanted lots of oil and blubber and lots of material that they get from these, that from, they got from these animals at these times, when you came across the right whale, it was the whale that you wanted to hunt. And that's why they called it the right whale. And unfortunately, we almost drove them to extinction, even before commercial whaling came along. In addition to being, or pardon me, because they are so fat, um, when you kill them, they actually float in the water column. And this makes it a lot easier. Most other whales will sink. So if you are hunting whales and you, you, you actually harvest a whale, if it's not a right whale, the chances are it's gonna sink. You need to find a way to keep that floating. With the right whale, these things are gonna keep floating. And this makes it very convenient for whaling, especially uh, uh, you know, in uh, pre-modern times. Um, these animals are also quite coastal. They don't tend to range very far offshore. Um, occasionally they do, but for the most part, they can be found close to shore, which also makes it easy for harvesting them and for bringing them to shore to be able to process them. And as a result, because they were so valuable in this way, we just about wiped them out. In fact, we thought they were gone. Uh, we thought that the North Atlantic right whale was completely wiped out, really, until uh, in the 80s, a couple of researchers found some right whales in the Gulf of Maine, the Bay of Fundy, and realized that they were still there. And since then, there's been a growing concern for protecting these animals and studying these animals. And this is where we're at today. So this is roughly the range where they live. This is a map of the east coast of uh, North America, Canada in the north and the United States in the south here. North Atlantic right whales, um, the pregnant moms tend to give birth down here in the southern U.S. states uh, in the shallow waters of Florida and Georgia. Then they will travel north in the spring up to the Gulf of Maine, Cape Cod, uh, Great South Channel. And in the summer months, they tend to move into Canadian waters. And it's in these northern areas where they actually feed the most and, and spend their time feeding. We figure they spend about half their year in Canadian waters, roughly, and half their year in American waters. One of the things, though, in living in this area is there are a lot of people here as well. And if we start looking at all of the different urban centers along this shoreline, this is an extremely heavily populated area. We have been fishing commercially in this area for centuries. We have many industries. We have many large cities with millions of humans. We have offshore industries like oil and gas and exploration. Now we have wind power development. We have naval operations and a large number of shipping that comes in and out of all of the ports along this shoreline. 
because this is also the habitat of the whale, it's been nicknamed the urban whale because it's a whale that lives and spends most of its life in close proximity to many large cities in North America. And unfortunately, that means it has a fairly tough life as well. If we zoom into New England, United States and the maritime provinces here in Canada, you can see the Gulf of Maine in the bottom of this picture and the Bay of Fundy in the center and the Gulf of St. Lawrence in the top right of this area. When the whales would come up to this area in the spring and the summer, there were four areas in particular where they were known to spend a lot of time. And for decades, scientists and conservationists really focused on these four areas here and these critical habitats they're often referred to. And the whales would reliably come back and they would spend uh, their time in each of these areas feeding uh, essentially is, is what they were doing here. They were feasting on the zooplankton, these little copepods, and the oceanographic conditions here were really good for producing enough food for these animals. We knew that there were some whales up in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Often there would be, see, there would be whales seen off of the coast of Gaspé of Quebec, just north of the New Brunswick uh, shoreline here that you can see. But there wasn't a whole lot of work or survey that was going on in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, but we suspected that there may be some. But something changed finally. In 2010, the whales didn't come back to the Bay of Fundy or they started to slow down. And in the subsequent years, fewer and fewer whales were showing up in the Bay of Fundy. This was a lot of panic. Uh, we didn't know where the whales were. I think I forgot to mention, these are of course critically endangered animals. There are only about 400 of them left currently. And it's been around that number for the last uh, decade or so. And all of a sudden they weren't coming back to where we expected them to be. This is a very serious situation. It's hard to protect animals by managing human activities if we don't even know where they are. It's difficult to study them. We don't know what's happening and we don't know what they're exposed to. We suspected that the Gulf of St. Lawrence might be a location where they were going. And it took quite a bit of time to try and get up the resources and the attention and the willingness of groups to go and start surveying in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. There were a couple of small surveys that were done in 2015 and 2016. And sure enough, we found some right whales. But finally, it was in 2017 when a real concerted effort took place to try and get out there and, and see if right whales are actually using the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Unfortunately, we did find right whales, but we also found this. This is a right whale floating on its back that has been killed. This was the first whale that was found in 2017. And sure enough, the whales were in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Some of the whales were in the Gulf of St. Lawrence feeding here, but unfortunately, a lot of them were killed. And by the end of 2017, some of you may remember, we had found 12 dead right whales in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. In addition to those 12, there were five other whales that were entangled in fishing gear and wrapped up in ropes. Some necropsies, necropsies are like studies of dead animals. Necropsies of some of the dead animals show that many of these animals were killed by blunt trauma, which is being smucked by something very big. And many of them died because they got tangled up in ropes and either drowned or became injured because of the, the ropes that were winding around them. At the time, everyone was freaking out. And you may remember this. Everyone was talking about right whales and what was going on. This is a cartoon from Michael Deadder. Michael is a, a, a cartoonist here in, in Halifax and, and works for a variety of news outlets and, and obviously is very aware of the right whale situation and a friend of right whales as well. And I, I like this cartoon because it kind of summed it up. Everyone was like, oh my gosh, what's going on? What a mystery. Why are all of a sudden all these whales dying? Well, they've always been dying. The two main threats that have always faced these whales, even before they changed habitats to the Gulf of St. Lawrence, was being struck by ships. And these are large ocean going cargo ships that share the same areas as right whales and becoming entangled in fishing gear and wrapped up in these lines. Uh, now these uh, being smucked by a ship is not a good thing and um, is often very lethal to the animals. Being entangled in the fishing gear is also a very horrific kind of thing. It looks so minor if you look at this picture a huge, extremely powerful, large whale like this with a few ropes around it or trailing out of its mouth doesn't look like very much. But the reality is that these ropes, very rarely do they part, do they break off and disappear, it seems. They're very strong and they'll actually saw into the animal and they can wound the animal 
They can make it difficult for the animal to feed if it's woven into its baleen, into the brushes of its mouth. They can make it difficult to swim if they're trailing a lot of gear. And so it's, it's very problematic. One of, the, one of the things that we know about this situation is because these whales are typically mostly black, when they become entangled, it creates a white scar on them, as you can see in some of these images. And scientists have done studies of these scars and, and the rates of scarring because the whales are photographed so much every year. There are scientists out there looking for them and taking photos of them. We can tell when animals have been entangled, even if we don't see them get entangled. And then they may have gotten free as well if they don't have any gear on them. And what we found is most of the population, 87% of the population has been entangled at one point or another because we can see these scars on them. And in any given year, more than a quarter of the population becomes entangled. And as I mentioned, there's only about 400 of these animals. So every year, about 100 of these animals become entangled in fishing gear. I shouldn't say in fishing gear, in rope. Most of the rope that's in our ocean comes from fishing gear. And so it's these ropes that are that are causing the problems. And we have a hundred of them each year. Sometimes the gear is still on them. Sometimes they're able to shed it and they're able to get it off of them somehow, but often it leaves scars. And sometimes the injuries from being entangled in this way will slow the animal down. And it could take a long time before it can start feeding and or having babies again. And this is a real problem for a population that we wanna see grow back to uh, where it was before we started to knock it down. Why are they getting entangled in so much? Well, we use the ocean a lot. We get a lot of benefits from the ocean and uh, fishing in particular. This is a map of the Gulf of St. Lawrence. These squares are showing where fishing was taking place, I think for a summer, um, a couple of years ago. You can see a few islands, PEI is in the south. The Ile de la Madeleine is in the middle of the Gulf of St. Lawrence here. Anticosti Island is in the north. And these squares are all showing where fishing is taking place. Where there's a green square, there's a bit of fishing. As there is more fishing, the colors are yellow and red. And this is exactly in the same area where the whales will come in and start feeding. And we have a lot of fishing that's taking place in these areas. And so this is one of the problems. If we take a look at shipping, here's a map of just how much shipping goes through some of these, uh, through the Gulf of St. Lawrence. This is the same sort of view that I was just showing you. And now the yellow lines and green lines are showing um, the amount of ships that are traveling through the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And so what becomes obvious, it's, it's not apparent when you just simply look at a piece of ocean, but what's obvious here is that there's a highway out there. There are thousands of giant cargo ships that go through the Gulf of St. Lawrence every year. And, and these are giant, these, these ships are a hundred to a thousand times larger than right whales. And right whales are big, big animals. And these things are moving through the Gulf very quickly and obviously very dangerous. In addition to these, this highway of, of ships that are going through the Gulf of St. Lawrence, there are also uh, some smaller but still large vessels crisscrossing throughout the Gulf of St. Lawrence, ferries, cruise ships, smaller coastal cargo vessels. And all of these uh, ships are doing very important services for us, but at the same time, they pose a real danger to right whales as well. So in 2017, after this happened, we realized we were in a, a fairly serious situation. The whales had shifted their habitat from the Bay of Fundy to the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Uh, more research showed that the reason they changed is that the food they were eating, the bugs, the copepods in the Bay of Fundy, suddenly weren't as productive as they were. They changed their production. This is because the ocean, just like our climate, is changing quite a bit and changing in temperature and it's becoming suitable for some things and unsuitable for others. So the whales moved to the Gulf of St. Lawrence where they found a food source and started feeding. There was a lot of concern though, because if there's not enough food there, these animals are not gonna survive. And what we found is after 2017, the calving season in 2018 was also bad news. We had no calves born that year none that we could find and, and none were born. And this was a real bad sign for an animal that had 12 individuals killed in Canada and actually in another five that were killed in the same year in the US. We had 17 of these animals out of the 400 or so that died in that one year. And so this is probably about that time that you may have started hearing a lot more about right whales because all of a sudden this became quite relevant. 
It was especially relevant because in the United States, the United States decided that anyone who was going to import seafood, you know, sell seafood to the United States needs to meet their rules for protecting marine mammals. This makes sense. They have a number of rules that their fishers have to follow if they want to harvest fish. So if they're going to buy seafood from another country, they need to make sure that that country is also following those rules. And this came out just the year before in 2016, the year before this right whale mortality crisis. And so rightly so, this became a real serious issue, not only for whales, but also for the maritime provinces in general. Fishing is a very important industrial activity. It's a very important commercial activity. Um, if all of a sudden we had no access to the US market, this is an important place where we sell a lot of seafood. It turns out that if we want to save fishing, we also have to save the whales. It isn't just about saving the whales in this case, there is a lot more at stake and we had to come up with some solutions. So a lot of stuff was done. Fisheries and Oceans Canada, which is the, the, the federal department that's in charge of managing uh, fishing among other things and our oceans, came up with a plan to exclude fishing from part of the Gulf of St. Lawrence. What you're seeing here in gray is a, is a part of New Brunswick and a part of Quebec. And this is the area, the dots are showing where most of the whales were in 2017. And Fisheries and Oceans identified this yellow square and said, there was a lot of whales in here. Let's have no fishing take place there in 2018. And furthermore, if three whales show up in another square somewhere else, we'll close that square and the other squares around it. So they took a very serious stance in trying to make sure that there was no fishing taking place near whales, at least where we knew. There were a number of other regulations, of course, that came in. They wanted to monitor whether fishers were losing their gear. They wanted to know if people were seeing whales and, uh, and they wanted to make sure that they continued to investigate any whales that, were, that they found that were dead. In addition, Transport Canada got involved. Transport Canada, among its many responsibilities, is in charge of shipping as well. And Transport Canada said, OK, we need to make a speed limit for large vessels moving through the Gulf of St. Lawrence. So they said, Vessels going through the Gulf of St. Lawrence can only do 10 knots unless you go through these specific channels, which they identified. And then if we ever see a whale in those channels, we're going to make all ships go 10 knots until the whales are gone. And so this went into place in 2018 as well. A tremendous amount of survey, aerial survey and surveys from vessel boats uh, took place so that people could find out where the whales were, as well as research in acoustic or listening technology to see where the whales were as well. And, uh, and a number of other regulations were in place. This was 2018. And what do we know? 2018, no deaths were found, not in Canada anyway. We did have three animals that became entangled. And of course, some of these right whales, I think three of them as well, died in US waters in 2018. But in Canadian waters, we had no deaths. What good news this was. Um, and, and clearly makes sense if we try to avoid where we are fishing, uh, where there are whales, if we try and slow vessels down where there are whales, perhaps we can reduce the number of deaths. And it seemed to be the case in 2018. Good news. Furthermore, in 2019, I hope you can see that. I'm not sure if that's blocked, but in 2019, we had calves again. We had seven calves that were born in 2019, which was the next calving year, which was actually just last January in 2019. Great news. This is really important news, not just because of the numbers, but what this means is that the moms, the right whale moms, can get enough food in the Gulf of St. Lawrence to actually give birth. Being a mom takes a ton of energy. Growing a whale in your body and then giving birth to that whale, feeding it milk, bringing it from Florida all the way back up to Canadian waters and feeding it milk this whole time, tremendous amount of energy this takes. So moms really need to put on and take in a lot of energy. And we we're really pleased to see that they could actually do this with the food they were getting from the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Seven is still a fairly, fairly low number, but it was really encouraging to see what the whales were doing. Great. Here we are 2019 now. We took a look at where the whales were in 2019. This is a map of the Gulf of St. Lawrence. The black dots show where the whales went in 2019. The yellow square is the area where there was no fishing and the red squares are the areas where there was no fishing. 
thousands of square kilometers were closed to fishing to try and protect this, this whale in 2019. Fisheries and Oceans Canada reviewed where the whales were and thought, well, we can change this a little bit because obviously they changed their distribution. And these were the rules that came out in 2019. The gray areas are areas where they can close fishing if there's whales. And in addition, the yellow area is an area where they said, okay, we're gonna have no fishing for the rest of the year. The green boxes show where speed restrictions can be in place uh, for large vessels tra tra traveling through these areas. 10 knots is what they had to go down to. They could go at, at full speed through the dark green channels unless a whale was seen and then they had to go back down to 10 knots. Very similar plans to what we had in 2018. Some minor changes here and there and some other rules that were changed but seemed like good rules. This seemed like a good plan until this fella showed up in 2019. This is a right whale who has these three scars on his back. Because of these three scars, he was known as Wolverine. Many of these right whales, not all of them, but many of them are given names um, so that they can be easily identified rather than by a number. And this was Wolverine. Makes sense if anybody knows what those scars look like. Unfortunately, this isn't how he was found. This is how Wolverine was found the first dead whale that we found in 2019. Bad news. And it also became bad news because we know a lot about these whales. Wolverine, for example, we knew was a nine-year-old male who first became entangled when he was five years old and he'd been entangled three times since then. And now in this case, he was found dead in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Uh, an investigation took place to try and figure out why he had died. They were a bit uncertain, but I understand the conclusions. We haven't seen the final conclusion yet, but they're leaning towards uh, blunt trauma, which is that he was struck by something large and heavy. So this is very unfortunate, especially because we know so much about it. It gets more disappointing, I'm afraid. This lady, her name is Punctuation. Uh, this large whale you see here with a calf. Punctuation was found dead in the Gulf of St. Lawrence on June 24th of last year, almost exactly a year ago, coming up. She was a 40 year old female. This is an important female. Um, as I mentioned to you, they, they don't start having babies until they're about nine or 10 years old. And she was 40 years old. In fact, she'd uh, survived entanglement five times and she'd been struck and scarred by ships twice and was still having calves. She had eight calves up to that point in her life. This is a very successful mother and a very impressive whale and a, and a real champ in the population, especially given all of the difficulties she was facing from the human activities. Unfortunately, of these eight calves, three of those were already killed because of other human activities. But the ones that survived went on and had calves of their own. And so that means punctuation was a grandmother. She had two granddaughters actually because of her calves. So really helping that population. The sad thing is one of those granddaughters had become entangled and died. So this is a very frustrating situation. In many ways, these animals are not simply numbers that are out there. These are almost individuals and we have enough information about these individuals to know what it is that we are doing to their lives and what we are doing to their families. This is more than causing a lot of problems for a species of animal. We are assaulting families of these animals as well, inadvertently, and we've got to try and solve this problem. By the end of last summer, as you may have heard, there were nine dead right whales found in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Uh, a nine-year-old male, a 40-year-old female, a 34-year-old male, an 11-year-old female, a 16-year-old female, the important thing here, I've got the females underlined here, is losing females is really, really not good for this population. It is only females that can have calves, and they have to be more than 10 years old to be able to have calves. And here we had lost uh, at least four uh, up to this point. In addition to these nine whales that were found dead in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, we had four others that were entangled in, in rope at this time as well. So the situation, uh, had become pretty bad. And this was the end of last, last fall, essentially. So let's take a look at what the population, what this population has been doing. So here's a graph. I'm not going to dwell on this for too long. Along the bottom line are years from 1990 up to 2015. And on the vertical line, 
this is the number, the abundance of right whales. These are estimates. These dots are different estimates for how many right whales there are. And this comes from a scientific paper. So the number of estimated right whales in 2015 was 458 animals. And you can see from even from the graph that as of around 2010, we start seeing a bit of a drop off in the numbers. You can see some red dots there and you can see some black dots. The black dots are the minimum population size. So they, they tend to be fairly small. The red dots are more accurate estimates of just how many animals are in this population. And so in 2015, we figured there was 458. And since then, in 2016, the population was estimated to be 451. In 2017, it was 411. And at the end of 2018, it was 409. We don't have the estimates for 2019 yet. It always takes a, a year to get the numbers and just to look at what happened. But uh, given that we had uh, uh, nine animals die in Canadian waters last year and one in the US, we had 10 animals die. Uh, and four other animals that are entangled, it's entirely likely that this number is going to drop even further. So the population is really dropping off now. And the problem is not only are they not being able to breed as well as they could, so they're not having as many babies as they did before, but it seems that the rate that they're getting into trouble with our human activities is also increasing. And that's a problem, but it's a problem we can do something about. Here's a couple of other unsettling thoughts, though. In this population graph that I just showed you, it just turns out it turns out that we actually do um, more harm to females than we do males. And actually, the number of females in the population is even less than males of these 400 or so animals that are left. And in fact, there are less than 100 females left that are of the breeding age. This is a real problem. A population of 400 doesn't sound like a very big population when in fact only 100 of these animals can actually help us recover the population. And so the situation is, is very dire. At the rate that we're killing them now, um, they could be extinct within 20 or 30 years. You know, um, I'm going to go out on a limb here and assume that most people watching this are going to be around in the next 20 or 30 years there is a good chance that we will all be witnesses to this animal going extinct unless we change something, unless we change the way that we're using the ocean. This is not something that's going to happen down the road. This is not something that's going to happen to a population, pardon me, a generation after us. This is something we are going to witness. Let me mention one other thing that's a little concerning about this. In the last three years in Canadian waters alone, we've had 22 right whales killed most likely by human activities. But do you remember what I said about why right whales are called right whales? They were the right whale to kill because when you killed them, they floated. So we have many other whale species that exist in Canadian waters. Humpback whales, fin whales, blue whales, say whales, minke whales. But this is the only one that floats. If it's the only other one that floats, are there other whales out there that are getting killed that we aren't noticing and aren't paying as much attention to? This is also something that's very concerning. There are many other things to be concerned about and start thinking about uh, to be able to understand what the situation is and to try and solve it. But I wanted to give you some quick insight into what that is. One last problem with this situation I'll tell you right now is that we're trying to figure out what to do and what, what this means is closing areas to fishing, for example, slowing down shipping. And this is getting a lot of people in these industries concerned. There's also concern in the US and in the United States, they're also talking about what they can do to prevent whales from dying. But of course, many of the fishers in the US are blaming Canada and saying, well, these animals are dying in Canada. So Canada needs to do something about it. Why are we being required to do something about it and not Canada? And for a while, Canadians were saying the same thing when there was more deaths in the US. This is not a helpful situation, of course. And what we need to realize is that anybody who is using the ocean needs to take responsibility for these situations and try and solve them. For example, here's another picture of an, here's a picture of another dead whale. This is a humpback whale that washed up in Scotland a couple of years ago. And it had drowned because it got entangled in a buoy line. Uh, a long line of rope with the buoy on the end of it and washed up on the shoreline of Scotland. They couldn't figure out which fishery had uh, 
uh, the buoy had come from and it had markings on it that they, that they didn't recognize, numbers on it that they didn't recognize. Then they realized it was a phone number and it was a phone number from Nova Scotia. And so eventually that number was called and it turned out a fisher had lost their buoy line, which happens often in fisheries because of weather, because of other ships and so on. And here it ended up being the cause of death for a humpback whale on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. If we are putting rope and gear into the water, we are not responsible only for the activities that occur in that area. That can have effects on animals and populations far outside of the areas that we, that we live and that our country looks after. In this situation, you know, these situations are very sad. Uh, I understand the fisher was very upset to hear this, as you can imagine, this is not something that anybody is trying to do. This is not something that anybody, including the fishing industry or shipping industry wants to happen. And it's a, it's a terribly sad situation. So what's being done about it? Well, let's start talking about what's going on here. Enough of that, that side of things. Lots of areas are being closed to fishing right now in Canada. These areas in red show um, areas that were closed to fishing in Canada last September. Thousands of square kilometers are being prevented from being fished in along the coast of Cape Breton, in the Bay of Fundy as well, as well as up into the northern Gulf of St. Lawrence, in an attempt to try and separate uh, fishing from right whales. Transport Canada has these slowdown areas that are still in effect. Ships are being slowed down whenever whales are in the area in an attempt to try and prevent that from happening as well. We are talking a lot with fishermen. We need to get the shipping and the fishing industry involved in trying to solve this problem and to try and find ways that we can continue to benefit from the ocean in ways that don't threaten wildlife. This includes understanding how fishing takes place. This is a, what we call a lobster trawl. This is a string of lobster traps that sit on the bottom of the ocean connected by a line called a ground line. And on each end of this trawl are buoy lines or end lines that connect the string at the bottom with a buoy at the surface. Any of these ropes can cause a, a whale to get entangled if they run into it, of course, and, and are obviously at a dangerous part of the fishing. This is a single of a crab trap. Crab traps in the Gulf of Southern Gulf St. Lawrence are often fished in what's called singles. So you have a single trap with a buoy lying to the surface, and this is what can uh, a whale might be able to get entangled in. One of the ways we might be able to solve this is by using ropeless fishing. Ropeless fishing is not fishing necessarily without ropes, but what it means is it means fishing without a rope in the water column. So the way that would work is that the rope would be held at depth with a buoy, if we can figure out how to do this. And when the fisherman needs to haul the trap, they can send out a signal and bring the buoy to the surface and then pull the trap up. It's also possible that they can do this without ropes. And in fact, if they can just inflate a balloon large enough at the bottom on the trap to be able to float it to the surface, then they can access it as well. And in both of these situations, there is very little or much, much less chance that a whale is going to become entangled. How this will work is what we're trying to figure out with fishers right now. What's going to work on the boat? Are they able to use some of these tools? And these are some of the examples that can be used. Will they be able to get retrieved? Are they able to catch lobster, for example, or crab, whatever you're fishing for? And we're trying to spend time testing these on fishing boats to make sure that we know, and, and not only us, people in the US as well, and many other organizations are testing this with fishers to try and find ways to, to better fish without risking danger to the right whales. There's a lot of research going on into the fisheries management practices. We need to know if keeping fishing away from whales is actually keeping them as safe as we hope it is and trying to study those effects. We're trying to figure out if there's other parts of the ocean that are more dangerous to whales than we realize and what we can do to protect whales from those human activities. We spend time studying where ships are going. We spend time studying the physics that's involved with ships that collide with whales. Are there slower speeds that they can travel? Is there better routing that we can use to try and separate shipping industry, which is a very important part of, of our lives, but something that we need to figure out how to continue to benefit from without accidentally killing animals. We spend a lot of time 
working with researchers. Many researchers are trying to figure out how whales are using the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And they're using devices such as gliders uh, and in partnership with the Ocean Tracking Network. These are robots that swim through the ocean and listen for the sounds that whales make, trying to identify the habitats that they're using in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Why are they using those habitats? When do they come to them? Um, you know, can we predict where they're going to go? Can we predict when they're going to arrive and, and understand better the behavior of the whales so that we can better manage the human activities that might be in the way when the whales start coming? There are also many, many other organizations and specialists, veterinarians who spend time trying to figure out why these whales die and have a very difficult task of pulling these animals ashore, sampling them at sea, um, spending time doing studies to figure out why they died. Getting them to shore is a large problem for these individuals and these organizations, but they want to try and contribute to the knowledge we need to make better decisions to protect these animals. And finally, there are many people, no, pardon me, there are some people who are specially trained to, to go after whales that are entangled in fishing gear and try and get that gear off them safely for the disentanglers as well as for the whales. And these, these individuals and these organizations are highly trained. Um, more of them are being trained. The equipment they use is very specialized. And these are also important services for trying to find ways to protect these animals from dying from, from fishing activities. So there are a tremendous number of other organizations and individuals, many moving parts to this, that, that are trying to solve the situation here where these animals are being killed inadvertently. Good news. This past winter, um, we had 10 calves now. So we have more whales than even last year, more calves were born than last year, and that's a great sign. Um, they're heading this way now. In fact, they're already in Canadian waters in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. The reason I put a but here, unfortunately, is there is a bit of bad news with these 10 calves. Within hours or a day of being born, one of these calves was already struck by a ship and terribly injured. They were uncertain it was going to survive. There was an attempt to try and give some antibiotics to it, even to try and get it to live. And as far as I know, it's not been seen since. But what a disappointing situation that even as these animals are trying their best to, to continue to have calves and continue to give birth to these animals, we can inadvertently cause damage when we're not even trying to cause damage. We certainly need to solve this situation. <clears throat> okay. Last couple of slides, I want to just conclude by telling you what I want you to know and possibly what you can do about this situation, then I'd be happy to take some questions. So first of all, right whales are an important part of our heritage. Why do we care about this? Why are we doing this? Well, they're a part of who we are as Canadians. You may never have seen one. Maybe you don't have the, the privilege of living on the coastline like I do and, and, and some people do and, and a chance to see right whales but they're still a part of who you are and you need to recognize that. They're an important part of our ocean ecosystem too. They're connected to many different things and they affect a lot of life around them as well. But if we lose them, that is a, that is a reduction of what Canada is. That is a loss of our world. And that is something that we don't have a right to do to generations that are gonna come next. These animals need to be here and that is why we need to do something about this. The second thing that I want you to know is that they are going to disappear unless we change. We need to change something. They are on the brink of extinction. They are being threatened specifically by human activities. And unless we change, they are going to disappear. Number three, what I want you to know is nobody is killing them on purpose. There is not an evil industry out there that is trying to destroy these animals and drive them off the earth. This is something that nobody wants happening. The fishing industry does not want this to happen. The shipping industry does not want this to happen. Nobody is killing these animals on purpose. The other difficulty is we don't have all the answers yet. We've been making great decisions for the last couple of years, and yet we still have animals that are right whales that are dying. We need to find more answers. We still need to do a lot more science. But despite these last two points, nobody is killing them on purpose, and we don't have all the answers yet. These are not excuses to do nothing. We need to do something. It's not good enough to say, well, we don't mean to kill them. Oops, we're sorry. Nope, not good enough. We need to find those solutions and we need to act now so that they don't disappear from this planet forever. 
here's what you can do. I'm sorry if my title is blocked there. First of all, don't panic, okay? This is not hopeless. These animals can recover. We need to remove the threats that they're facing right now. Do not panic. Number two, keep learning. I'm so pleased that you're here to listen to this and to, to, to be a bit better informed about what's going on and to find out what all this talk about right whales are. Keep watching about right whales, ask questions, learn more about it. And then related to this, teach other people about this situation. Let them know what the situation is and why it's important. If you don't, we can't get that information out. Related to teaching people, you actually need to tell the leaders, both in government and the people using the ocean, that this is important. The government of Canada and the government of the United States are working hard to protect this whale. They need to know that that needs to continue. They need to keep making those tough choices and tough decisions to make sure this animal survives. The same is true of the fishing and shipping industry. Those industries need to understand that this is important to everybody and that they need to try and find a solution. Make sure, tell people that you want decisions that are based on science. We need decisions that are based on evidence. We don't need good instincts. These animals, we can't afford to make a decision and then all of a sudden realize it didn't make enough difference. We need to make sure the decisions we make are good for these animals right away and that's how we're going to solve them. Science needs to be involved in these decisions. That's what we need to, to, to help drive the answers to the situation that we're trying to solve here. And finally, look for ways to help. You can support some of these many organizations that are involved with right whales and trying to do right whale conservation, for example. And in some ways you can play a role. If you go to marineanimalresponse.ca, there's a lot of information about what to do that if you are on the coast, if you are one of the privileged who get to live on the coast in this country, or even if you just visit the coast, you got to know what to do when you come across an animal that's entangled or an animal that's dead on a beach. You need to know who to contact depending on what part of the country you're in, and that information is going to be there. The last couple of things I want to tell you, a couple of websites you can check out. The North Atlantic Right Whale Consortium, narwc.org, is a is a consortium of scientists and conservationists and, and managers who want to see right whales uh, protected. You can find a lot of information there. The whale map is found at whalemap.ocean.dal.ca. You can take a look and see where whales are being found in almost, almost real time uh, in, in Canada and US waters. So you'll see where the whales are. And another resource for you is Hinterland Who's Who, hww.ca. There are videos about many different types of wildlife, including right whales and lots of information. And all of these are gonna be important resources for you to learn more and, and to see more about right whales and become better informed. So thank you very much for your time. There is a lot more to be said about right whales. Um, if the opportunity is available, I would like to see if we can do another webinar throughout the season. Our 2020 season is just getting started now. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen with right whales this year. There are a lot of researchers. There are a lot of specialist responders. There's a lot of surveys that are taking place. Stay tuned. If we have a chance to come back and talk with some of these people, I'll be pleased to bring them to you so that you can hear from them about the work that they're doing and why it's important. If you have any questions, you're welcome to contact me at the information below as well. Uh, my my email and the website for the Canadian Wildlife Federation is there where we have lots of information about the work we're doing on right whales. And I hope to have a chance to talk to you again. And if we have time, I would love to take some questions if we have anybody out there with any questions. So thank you very much. Hello, Brendel. <laughs> thank you so much, Sean, for telling us um, about the right whales today. As a shark person, I learned quite a bit today um, about the whales, mostly that they're Fat, plumpy, and round, I believe, is what you said repeatedly. <laughs> no, they, um, they, have, they have quite a sad story. Um, it's unfortunate, but you're right, it's not hopeless. So you're right about the questions. There's quite a few. So we're ready to take those questions from the audience now, and I'm going to give you your first one. Right. Um, so will right whales find other food if they lose their main food source, i.e. copepods? Uh, they are copepod specialists, so that is what they need to feed on the most. Fortunately, copepods are the 
probably one of the most abundant animals in the ocean. Um, right whales need to find where they're found in high densities. Uh, I feel very confident that they will. Uh, it's not likely that they will lose their food source. They will lose areas and they will go and find other ones. These animals have been around for millennia and, um, and I expect that they've been confronted with loss of food before and they know how to go out and find some. So uh, it's a concern because we're trying to manage our activities around them, but it's not so much a concern for the animals. I think they, uh, they'll do a good job finding the food if it's out there. Great, thanks. Okay, the second question. Um, so what, what are the ecosystem impacts if we lose this species? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Uh, in some ways, the ecosystem impacts are gonna be things that we may not notice. There's only 400 of these animals left. Um, it's not like we're all of a sudden going to have an overabundance of copepods in the world, but these animals do have effects on us. Uh, for example, recent research has shown just how important whales are for storing carbon when it comes to removing carbon from the atmosphere. These are very large, long-lived animals, uh, and so they, they, when we, if we've removed an entire population, that's a lot of carbon that is not sequestered. They are important mixers of the ocean. They dive near the bottom of the ocean and feed on these copepods, and then they bring it up and leave a lot of waste on the surface of the ocean. So they're important mixers in the ocean as well. It's difficult to say. Um, the, the short answer is they are certainly connected to many things in the ocean, and their loss is going to be a loss for the ocean. Unfortunately, because us humans are so clever, we may not notice the loss, and, uh, and so that's the real danger. Right, thank you. Okay, so next question. Uh, what was happening prior to 2017 and why were there so many in that year? What had changed? That's a really great question. The fr we're not sure because there wasn't a lot of looking. As I said, there were some small surveys that went on in 2015 and 2016. And when we did those surveys, we actually found some dead whales in the Gulf of St. Lawrence at that time as well. Uh, the scary thing is to think that this has been going on since before 2017, which it very likely has been, and we were just unaware of it. So um, the whales were in the, in the Bay of Fundy. There was a lot of management that did take place in the Bay of Fundy when that was where many, where a large part of the population was. There was um, shipping was shifted to avoid the whales. Fishing was managed to try and not get in the whales way. But when the whales moved, we had none of those plans in place for where they moved to. So um, it's entirely possible that this bad situation has been going on longer than we realize. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, so question number four, it, do these whales have to compete with other whales or other fish species uh, for their food source? Yes, they do. Uh, there are other species that feed on these types of uh, food sources. Um, uh, basking sharks, for example, and other filter feeding animals will feed on these. So they'll compete, but um, there's not as much competition as there was. It's expected that these populations used to be much, much larger than they were. Uh, so um, they're not the only ones that use that food source, but they're certainly not limited because they're competing. So, uh, but, but really good question. These are, these are amazing questions. I know. The question's it's, really great. Like, <laughs> so, That's amazing. so the next one is, is pretty good too. Um, is it possible to fit ships with sonar or some kind of sound emitter to warn the whales to stay away? Yeah, what a great idea. These are, these are some of the great ideas that have been discussed. Um, that makes sense. And, and it seems like it would make sense, right? You're walking across the street and a bus honks at you. I jump, right? Um, that's what humans do. That's not, unfortunately, what whales do. Uh, whales did not, um, they did not evolve in a way that makes them scared of loud noises. And so a lot of the research done on this suggests that when you make a loud noise near whales like that, they don't react. Sometimes they react and go to the surface of the water and that's it, which actually might make the situation worse. So unfortunately, this is a great example that seems like a good idea, but needs good science behind it. And the science suggests it's just not going to, it won't work that way. They don't uh, get out of the way like Sean does diving out of uh, the front of a bus. Um, we need to find a, another solution, but it's a great idea. These are the kind of ideas we need to hear. Yeah. Yeah. So do shipping fishing regulations get made based on distribution data from the previous season um, or are the first couple of months or the first couple of months of the, of the current season? <clears throat> yeah, really good question. For the last couple of years, that has been what was done is that um, the fisheries managers 
would look at where the whales were the previous year and try and guess where they are going to be this year. Um, they got it mostly right, but not always right. Uh, so this year they're doing something different. So they've decided to wait and see where the whales are. And wherever a whale is, Fisheries and Oceans closes that area of that um, where that whale was seen. And if that whale is seen again in that area or a whale is seen again in that area, they close the whole area for the rest of the season. So they're actually trying to be a lot more adaptive right now to try and better close the areas to make sure, first of all, that they don't close them sooner than they need to, but also to make sure that they're closing the right areas to protect the whales. So um, it's changing and adapting even as we're talking about it. Great question. I know, they just keep coming. <laughs> okay, so next one. A humpback whale was recently seen far up in the St. Lawrence River in Montreal. Why would it be, and could right whales start moving from the Gulf into the river, and what are the implications of this? Ooh, yeah, great question. Well, um, it's not weird, uh, first of all. I think that wildlife used to go a lot of places, and wildlife often goes in weird places. Sometimes they go in places that get them in trouble, uh, and they get into places where they shouldn't be. Now, uh, a whale can handle going up a river into fresh water. They can handle being in fresh water for a while. It's, it's not so good for them, but they can handle it. So that's not a big deal. The bigger problem is that they're close to Montreal, which is a, a, another big city, lots of shipping going on, lots of industry, lots of pollution. Uh, so that's a real problem. Um, I hope that that whale can get out of there. He's a long way from where he should be. It is unusual for them to be there. It's not unheard of. Um, but it's a very serious situation. Yes, right whales have gone up rivers before too. There've been right whales that have swam up different rivers in the US and, um, and similarly can find themselves in trouble. Sometimes they can get themselves out of trouble as well. So um, as we do a better job managing whales and managing our wildlife, we're gonna have more and more wildlife in our world. So we need to be prepared for these unusual situations too. It's a good problem to have in some ways, but, uh, but we certainly don't want to see these animals suffering. Mm. Thank you for that question. It's a good point. Have GPS trackers been attached to any of the whales? Yeah. You know, when I first started working with these whales as well, 10 or 12 years ago or so, that was what I was thinking too, is I'm like, why don't we just track all of these whales? Well, um, what you learn very quickly is you can't do this. Uh, these animals, um, first of all, if you want to track a caribou or something, you shoot the caribou, you lay it down, and you attach stuff to it. If you're a shark expert like Brendel here, you maybe catch a shark, bring it alongside the boat, keep it alive, drill something through its fin, take some measurements on it, let it go. You can't do this type of thing with a whale, first of all. Can't tranquilize it, can't bring it aside a boat, can't lay it down. Second of all, you got nothing to attach to. There's no fin, there's no shell, um, there's no ears or anything. You certainly can't put anything around the tail either. We do do some, scientists do do some tagging of whales. So they'll use suction cups, but um, these whales are very physical. So they rub against each other and the suction cups eventually come off. We even use harpoons still. And some scientists will harpoon whales with trackers in them and puncture the whale into the tissue of the animal. But these also eventually come out and they also apparently cause fairly bad wounds when it happens too. So people are, are um, not pleased by that. The short answer is we can't tag these. We can tag them for very short periods of time. Um, we tend to only get a couple of weeks of data, maybe a month or so, and then the tag falls off. So it doesn't work so good. One other question, uh, one other problem I'll add to that, to that question is it's difficult to get close to these animals to do that. As I said, we can't exactly um, tranquilize them or lure them in with a fishing line or something. And, uh, and we don't actually see all of these animals every year. There are about 400 animals in this population, but in the Gulf of St. Lawrence last year, there were less than 200 different whales uh, in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. We don't know where the other 200 go. So they're feeding somewhere else that we don't know yet. So we can't even get our hands on most of the population as well, which is another problem, but a really obvious question. And, uh, and, and I'm glad that you brought that up because I meant to mention that. I guess one of the best ways to track them right now is probably through the gliders, right, Sean, the autonomous marine vehicles? It seems, it certainly is one of the best options. So these are acoustic animals, so they make sounds. Um, these animals don't use sonar like some whales. Toothed whales use sonar. These animals are more like moose, 
or cows, they make sounds constantly and they communicate with each other with sounds. And so one of the best ways for keeping track of where they are is to listen for them. And so the gliders, as well as buoys with hydrophones on them and, and other options, these are some of the best options for, for finding where the whales are. The problem is it is a big, big ocean out there and we have to listen to a lot of it. And these little robots can only listen to little pieces at a time. So we need more and more. Well, we're out of time for today. There's actually a lot more questions, but maybe um, maybe folks can can write you, you know, on your email if they have more questions. So thank you all for tuning in and please watch the Ocean Tracking Network and the Canadian Wildlife Federation's social media channels for more news and webinars on the North Atlantic right whales that we'll be sharing throughout the summer. Um, we'll also be posting a recording of this video and a summary of ways to help conserve North Atlantic right whales in the coming days. So please stay tuned for that. Again, thank you everyone for being here, tuning in. Thank you, Sean, for your presentation. We're wishing everyone an amazing, educational and inspiring Oceans Day 2020. Thank you everyone. Happy Oceans Day. Thanks so much. Bye-bye everybody.